Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for conversations in high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. During this segment, we will be discussing immunotherapy approaches in the treatment of BCG naive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. I am Dr. Abhishek Tripathi. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutics Research at the City of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Matthew Galski and Dr. Joshua Meeks. Welcome. So starting off the discussion, we, we have been um, uh, looking at um, a large population of trials and a lot of innovation happening in, in the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer space. But uh, we still know that BCG is quite effective as initial therapy for most patients with high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So I would like to uh, get your thoughts, uh, Dr. Meeks, on what's the, what's the impetus and the need for innovation in the BCG naive space knowing that the efficacy of BCG has such a long-standing track record? Yeah, I, I think that the real goal of new therapies would be number one is escaping the shortage. I mean, I, I think if you look at the numbers, 40% of patients that could benefit from BCG aren't able to get it. So some therapy that could replace it, whether that be in the maintenance or the induction phase, I also think that, you know, we still fail in some patients, right? I mean, we know that 20% will recur. I worry less about that, but there's another 5% that have progression. They're really high-risk patients that we take to cystectomy. You know, we know those patients are going to have a rough go. So if there's some drug that could let people keep their bladders and cure their cancer, I mean, that's really what we're aiming for here. Absolutely. And um, I think it's interesting to note that patients seek out different forms of therapies. And I think some of it might be derived uh, from and driven by uh, patient requests as well. So for example, I personally get several referrals looking for alternative treatment sometimes. And with all the innovation uh, in metastatic space with immunotherapy, I get that question a lot. If immunotherapy can be an option for my superficial bladder cancer. So, uh, Dr. Galski, uh, given your extensive experience in the space, what do you think the best rationale would be for developing immunotherapy in the non-Muslim basal space, specifically with the BCG naive setting? So, in the BCG naive setting, um, it, we know that modulating a patient's immune system works. I mean, we have proof of concept with BCG. Um, you know, we always say that we don't know how BCG works. And I think in part that's true, although that could be said of any any treatment that we use for cancer. I think we know a lot more about how BCG works now than we did traditionally. And, and so I think one can argue that it, at the very least, we know that if you can induce some sort of inflammation in the bladder, um, then that could lead to clinical uh, uh, Im improvement um, in, you know, that's ultimately uh, we're trying to trigger an innate immune response to then uh, ideally lead to an adaptive immune response and, and, and maybe we could get there quicker uh, by adding uh, immune checkpoint blockade. So I think there, there's certainly rationale. Of course, we know that when you give BCG, there's going to be some uh, increase in interferon gamma in the, uh, within the tumor microenvironment, and we know that that can cause compensatory increase in um, in, in PD-1 in, in, in the tumor microenvironment. So just from the very basis of giving those drugs together, uh, you might expect them to work well together. Absolutely. And... I always tell my uh, tell my fellows that as much as medical oncologists have taken credit for developing immunotherapy, it was the urologist that <laughs> brought up the first immunotherapy, true immunotherapy with a, a local anti-tumor immune response. So makes uh, makes sense to combine them together. Um, Dr. Meeks, uh, have you encountered a lot of patients uh, requesting immunotherapy uh, for BCG naive setting? And uh, how's that discussion been uh, considering all the buzz around immunotherapy? Yeah, I think it's really interesting that, you know, more patients come in asking about checkpoint therapy than this antiquated tuberculosis vaccine that they've never heard of. I mean, they, they're able to see all the commercial industries that, you know, talking about checkpoint therapy that could apply to their cancer. So I, I get a lot of questions about patients interested in that. And really, when we talk to them about trials, it's pretty easy. They, they, they know these drugs. They've heard of them. Many of their family members have been on them. So I actually thought having a discussion with a patient about this would be kind of a hard thing to begin because I'm so used to thinking about therapy in the bladder 
but it's actually surprisingly easy. And part of that is just because of this oncology community where patients come in and they, they already have some sense of the therapy and, and what to expect. And that's been a similar experience, I'm sure, at uh, other centers as well. Um, we have a multitude of trials ongoing in the BCG naive setting. And then the Keynote 676, specifically the, the second cohort that was activated, the Alvin trial, which is predominantly a European trial, the Potomac trial, all of these trials are combining a B, uh, the BCG with, with different um, uh, maintenance and induction schedules and how much BCG is administered is slightly unique and different to these uh, trials. And they're combining it with different uh, immunotherapy agents. How do you, uh, for, uh, with Dr. Galski, how do you foresee com um, uh, medical oncology and uh, urology kind of working together as these uh, trials move forward and, and they get integrated earlier in the lines of therapy? Yeah, I think there's going to be a learning curve involved in, in this is not, um, it, it's not easy to coordinate receiving two different treatments, potentially in two different practices, maybe not geographically located in, in, in the same place. And so I think there are some challenges there. Uh, of course, we have experience giving chemo radiation for a variety of conditions, oftentimes also not being administered in the same center and, and requiring, you know, up to weekly to more than uh, weekly treatments with, with both modalities. So I think there's a precedent for it, but there's going to be a learning curve. Absolutely. Any change in drug flows from a BCG administration standpoint, uh, Dr. Meeks? No, I, and again, you know, I know that, you know, for example, one of these trials, the CREST trial, the drug is given, you know, and on a local, it's not given systemically. So, you know, I know that I've seen increasing enthusiasm from surgeons potentially being in, involved more and directly giving them, and some of them give them by IV al already. So I, I'm really interested to see where that goes in, in the future and how, how much of a role potentially, you know, as surgeons were playing in, in giving drugs. But I think right now, like you said, it's coordination with our partners in medical oncology. And it's very easy for those groups that are together, but I, I, I don't, I wonder in the future how all that will be combined and, you know, if, if, all the stuff that you've developed, we could be codified for us as surgeons potentially. So I think there's a lot more interest. At least that's what I what I've seen from the urology community. Absolutely, and I feel that the urologists are so much more conducive to doing procedures and administration of BCG. Their clinics are optimized for that. And uh, so, and so, a lot of our patients will have local uh, urology in the community, and they would come for a systemic therapy consultation at academic centers and larger centers, or even regional medical oncology practices. Mm -hmm. And so, I feel that uh, they're going to need to work more geographically and across disciplines as uh, these combinations move forward. Uh, looking at some of the results we have so far, so we have uh, several ongoing trials. Uh, we have some results from the TRUCE2 uh, trial, which is looking at tislizumab in combination with NAP, Pacbitaxilo, uh, Braxane, uh, where patients uh, were treated with every three weeks for uh, every three weeks for three or four cycles and an event response assessment, and the and the uh, and about 55% of patients had a complete response. And the rest of the patients having stability of uh, disease. Uh, how does how does results uh, like these play into the clinic, and how do you interpret them in the context of established efficacy with BCG? Dr. Meeks. Yeah, I think you know we'll have to see going forward how how feasible all that is. It's it's a lot of therapy for patients, so I don't know like how feasible that's going to be. Absolutely. And I'm assuming that the incorporation of chemotherapy agent like Abraxane um, or NAPAC to Taxil is going to induce more systemic toxicities as well. So something for us to talk about and think about um, uh, in terms of uh, tolerability. Uh, looking at several other uh, modalities of action, what are some of the agents that we are excited about going forward beyond immune checkpoint inhibitors? Dr. Galski? So I, you know, I think in the BCG and responsive space, there's just a ton of activity and lots of new mechanisms and even new ways of administering treatment. And so all of that's going to move earlier, right? That's what we do in oncology. We test things later and then we move them earlier. 
So I, I think all of that's going to move earlier. And whether or not there's mechanistic rationale for those same drugs in BCG unresponsive and BCG naive disease, I think that's a question we'll have to ask ourselves. But I think, you know, regardless of that, some of these agents show single agent activity. And so I think they're they're going to move forward. That's what happens. Absolutely. And Dr. Meeks, I think in the setting of BCG Shorty that all of us are still battling uh, at some level, have you considered using some of these uh, later lines of therapy and have had discussions with patients using them in the naive setting? Yeah, I think where we've been interested in is is trying alternative treatments, right? So I think the, you know, sequential chemotherapy intravesically, you know, that's gained a ton of popularity. I mean, again, that's basically changing how we're giving local, you know, intravesical treatments. As far as systemic chemotherapy, I think we've seen less of that. I know there's a lot of interest in, in radiotherapy for non-muscle invasive disease. I haven't seen much of the data from that, uh, but I know there's a lot of enthusiasm and some, some early reports. So it'll be interesting to sort of see what those look like and how well that's adopted. Absolutely. So I'll round that out by uh, talking about an average patient that comes into our clinic, about 70-year-old patient uh, that I saw uh, about a few days ago. And he was incidentally diagnosed with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, high risk with CIS, and has yet to receive uh, BCG uh, in the setting. And we are struggling to find the adequate source of BCG for him. So how would you counsel that patient? Uh, and what would be the best uh, next step in management for him? Dr. Meeks? Yeah, I mean, again, if you can't get BCG, I think, you know, Jim Cytobine docetaxel would be the best thing if he's a standard, you know, for example, high risk patient. You know, if there are features you're concerned about, varying histology, LVI, cystectomy, wouldn't be, would be an un, wouldn't be an unreasonable thing. And then obviously, you know, you, you folks are both involved in clinical trials. That's That's one of the benefits of potentially having trial options for folks is that you have a potential alternative for the for these patients. Absolutely. Any additional comments from Dr. Galski? No, I, I mean, I think that, you know, of course, these are patients who are predominantly seen by urologists, untreated um, uh, carcinoma in situ. And uh, I think that some of the tricks that my urology colleagues tell me about in terms of trying to manage BCG, you know, lower doses, those types of things, I think it, 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 there, are, there are various strategies that are being employed. Um, ultimately, we need the data. Um, and certainly a large randomized study, you know, U.S. cooperative group study really trying to definitively establish the role of, uh, uh, I guess, two, I sh we should mention, right? One, alternative strains of BCG going to be an incredibly important study. And two, whether or not intravesical sequential chemotherapy is, is, is good or better than BCG, and those will be practice changing. Absolutely. And we look forward to the results of some of those pivotal studies ongoing. Thank you so much for joining us for this segment on immunotherapy approaches in treatment of BCG-naive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Please be sure to click on the landing page of this activity to claim your AMA, ANCC, ACP credit, and access supplemental slides, as well as topic segments and case scenarios.